So. All right, cool. Um, awesome. So we are live. Hi, all. So uh, uh, like we have with us Mike Kerno, who is the CEO of Defiant Networks. Uh, and his focus basically is on designing secure network overlays uh, for Zero Trust. Uh, and also, he's an architect for ICS and OT security. Uh, and he, in, in this talk, he'll be focusing on how cellular network uh, and infra could be exploited uh, for extracting uh, and, and uh, stealing UE identities and how to get around it. Uh, uh, I'll uh, encourage you all to ask questions in Q&A uh, uh, and we'll sort of like get those questions to Mike at the end of the talk. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to Mike. Over to you, Mike. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, all right. So, uh, uh, welcome to Cell Games, uh, mitigating mobile networking mayhem and cellular enabled connected uh, connected vehicles and transportation systems. Bit of a long-winded title. I tend to title things exactly as they are, <laughs> um, and it is by me, Mike Kerno. And uh, just a, a, a quick little TLDR. I'll be talking about. Um, gaps in the uh, radio resource control protocol for cellular networking on RAN. So um, put that little TLDR here, just in case. The agenda that I will go over today, uh, just going over it, my own short introduction, uh, talk a little bit about rogue base stations, uh, cell selection process in RRC, uh, cellular technology and critical infrastructure today. Uh, some connected vehicle cell, cell attack vectors um, that um, uh, that are noted in here, and then uh, some potential mitigations and going to summary and closing. So without further ado, just go into my, my quick intro. Uh, who am I? I'm the CEO of Defiant Networks. Um, we're working on making the next generation of internet, pretty much. Um, and that is, you know, uh, overly network for the internet on uh, complete, you know, zero trust suite of protocols that we've developed. Uh, if that sounds cool, that's because it is pretty cool. And I'm more than happy to talk about it. Uh, anytime after this presentation, just uh, reach out. At the end, I'll have contact info and I'll be available to talk after after this particular this uh, presentation. Uh, I'm also the ICS and OT, uh, Industrial Control Systems and Operational Technology Cybersecurity Operations Architect uh, at, a, at a very large uh, critical infrastructure and civil engineering and architecture firm uh, where I design cybersecurity architecture for uh, varying scales of critical infrastructure and civil engineering projects and uh, transportation, water, power, um, that, that kind of realm. So moving on to just, uh, uh, you know, so there's, there's a lot of content in this presentation, so I am going to be uh, talking briefly on these, and I'll let the slides do the rest of the talking as well. So rogue-based stations are essentially devices uh, that mimic the capabilities of an actual cell tower and their respective cells for their cell coverage. Uh, IMSI catchers are a rogue-based station that, are, that is in the most simplest configuration where it tries to... Uh, trick your 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 user equipment or your ue which is everything like your your mobile phones your 4g 5g or cellular enabled onboard equipment in a vehicle uh could be cellular enabled routers etc um it tricks your ue into uh divulging the imz or the international mobile subscriber identity which is basically you know just it resolves down to who's paying for the service you know aka you right um, these devices, they're also uh, known as Stingray or Stingrays because that's a really popular brand among government agencies, law enforcement and all that. Um, so if you hear Stingrays uh, ever used in this kind of parlance, that's because it's referring to a specific brand of MZ catchers that's sold to these organizations. Um, and uh, there's also a, a KPEC, a NIST testimonial, and a um a a CISA national infrastructure protection program uh challenge in the recent past couple of years around detecting base stations because it, it is of uh, rogue base stations are a national security 
uh, threat, according to these various agencies. Um, but yeah, it's, it's got its own KPEC, which is just a, a common attack pattern enumeration and classification, like how you go through an attack. Uh, it's got a NIST testimonial uh, bolstering data privacy, mobile security, um, talking about MZ catcher threats. And there's also a NIST standard too. I think it's uh, 161 or something. It's basically about uh, LTE and mobile network security. So it, this is a known, it's not a super highly talked about topic, but it is known. It, it's it's uh, documented and, and researched a little bit from varying perspectives regarding the lens of personal privacy, at least. Um, so going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, who, who uses these, right? Generally, just to put things in you know broad brush strokes, uh, you've got law enforcement. And law enforcement, uh, they utilize these for like large protests and stuff to figure out who's attending these, you know, large events, uh, just like dragnet hoovering of MZs from people's phones. Uh, also for, you know, serving warrants, making sure the people that are at home, making sure that uh, the device of the person of interest is nearby, etc. Um, I've also heard some stories, some some interesting stories too about you know hikers getting lost in the woods and sheriffs going out there with these devices to try and find people. Like any technology, it's got its good and it's bad, right? Um, and I got this picture of Ronnie Coleman here because um, you might not know who he is, but he's an eight-time Mr. Olympia uh, winner. Of, you know, bodybuilder guy. He's one of my favorite athletes. Uh, then criminals, and uh, on the criminal side, uh, you can use your imagination to, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, contrive any number of scenarios where a a, uh, a bad actor may want to use this kind of technology. Uh, maybe even for the same reasons that law enforcement do, but for more nefarious uh, means. Um, so then next, uh, uh, how can I get one? Uh, commercial purchase is really difficult because the manufacturer, the, the legitimate manufacturers of these, uh, they only sell to law enforcement. Um, and that is uh, is like Stingray, Phantom Technologies. I think L L3 has their own line of this stuff. Um, there, there's a few big names out there. Um, there's also do-it-yourself solutions uh, where you can build your own, you can build your own uh, rogue base station for approximately 2k uh, USD and you don't really need anything too crazy on the OS side there's a lot of open source stuff out there your real cost constraint it's mainly determined by the the power of your radio equipment that you purchase for this um, and I, I'll have links I share at the end of you know some things that I have found uh, open source repositories and do-it-yourself links and all that but I'm not gonna get too too much into that here but uh, so moving on um, so here is just a, um, that's supposed to be white background. Um, I'll talk about this later. I was just kind of showing a, a high level overview of a open source solution. I'll talk about it later on. I didn't realize I didn't have the white background. Uh, so getting into how this all works, uh, we'll be talking, uh, just really briefly into the, um, uh, the NAS attach procedure, the non-access stratum attach procedure, basically how the UE um, you know, uh, attaches to the cell of a cell tower and then attaches to the, um, the back end components to actually facilitate, uh, you know, internet and, and mobile and SMS and phone call connectivity. Um, so the NAP is what allows the UE to, to talk on the, the core network, um, or the, uh, what's behind the cell tower pretty much. Now I'll get into that with some diagrams here. So just really quickly, um, uh, you on the left we have just a, a single uh, single cell single cell tower coverage um, where you have uh, various cells typically there's six cells that each have approximately you know 60 degrees of coverage so that they form a full 360 degree uh, coverage map and then you have a location tracking area or a location area or a tracking area depending on the parlance in 4g versus 5g documentation um, in which the coverage is represented, um, you know, as, as hexagons so that when cell providers are planning, they plan in this kind of hexagonal lattice as so. Um, the, the hexagonal lattice model isn't exactly, it, it's not, ex sorry, it's not exact. Um, typically you end up having coverage that looks a bit, you know, kind of amorphous like this, where you hit constraints, uh, coverage constraints based on 
terrain or um, you know structures nearby, and you you'll often have you know smaller cells or, or femto cells. They're uh, technically called. They're just smaller cells that help facilitate areas of coverage that are lacking for either a particular cell in a, a cell or cell tower to tracking our location area or just to serve some you know particular facility or entity or something um, and so just some quick high level architecture uh, so just kind of splitting it down the middle here uh, on the left, we've got the radio access network, which is basically, it's everything from your, your UE to the cell tower itself. So it's your mobile or uh, cell connected devices to the cell of a cell tower. Um, and then on the back end, uh, we've got the back end components, um, which this is what, uh, you know, facilitates the actual communication for calls, SMS, text, and all that. Uh, and internet connectivity. And this is uh, just how the LTE NAS attached procedure works. Very similar for 5G. The only difference is that your your enemy HSS, uh, your various gateways here, these are more virtualized than they are uh, hard, you know, bare metal components. Um, so at the top here, we have random access. I'm only going to go through a few of these here. So at the top, we have random access. So it, it, at all times, uh, cells of your nearby cell towers are just shooting out information to all UEs in the area, whether it's in your service, uh, whether it's, you know, in your service or not, AT&T versus Verizon versus whatever else is out there, um, you know, pick a provider, right? And it's constantly shouting out, hey, I'm here, look at me, pick me. Hey, I'm here, look at me, pick me. And in that, you have identifying information. You've got, uh, you've got signal uh, strength and quality information, uh, max and mins of signal strength and quality. So the UE itself doesn't actually measure phone signal uh, or, or, sorry, cell signal. I'll probably end up saying phone a lot, but I mean UE, right? So UE means phone and everything else. Um, and uh, uh, your UE doesn't actually measure signal. It's told what signal is, and it does its own calculations based on um, the parameters given by the cell. And then you have, uh, next you have the RRC, uh, which has been a big focus of mine, a rather large focus for the past two years here um, in both privacy implications and implications of physical damage and potential loss of life in cyber physical systems. Uh, and so the RRC, that's the actual protocol that implementation lives in the baseband processor, or chipset, or modem inside your UE. And that's what determines, hey, I've got this information from the cell, um, you know, based on my service, the service area, my service subscriber, and based on the, the, the figures of power and quality it gives me, should I add this to my list of things to connect to and or connect to it immediately? Um, and then next, you actually go through with the NAS attach request and then the packet data network connectivity request. Uh, subsequent to that is when your UE divulges the MZ information. So, <clears throat> All right, so going to move on to the next part here. Uh, what do they do? In the most basic configuration, a rogue base station is an MZ catcher. Really, it just uh, um, tricks the UE into divulging uh, subscriber information to something that's not actually, that may or may not really even be connected to a core network. Uh, in the most advanced configuration, um, a rogue base station can actually complete that NAS attach procedure um, where it, it can be very difficult to actually connect to a legitimate already existing core network. But uh, because uh, I've been researching this topic for two years, and I still don't know the exact capabilities of what manufacturers actually produce, but I have scoured uh, open source repositories to which, you know, it's n not at all a far bridge to build to say that these devices in the most, most advanced configurations can actually emulate um, a functional facsimile of a core network. Um, and therefore acting as a man in the middle. So anything man in the middle or sync pulling attacks, that kind of stuff, that's, you know, something that uh, could occur from, you know, if you fall victim to a more advanced configuration of this technology. 
And uh, so just refreshing on the last slide, that's the attach procedure here. I love architecture. Now we're going to uh, look at how this how this looks for the IMSI catcher NAS. And so the IMSI catcher um, will be the, the rogue base station, right? The rogue base station um, tells the phone all the, it whispers all the sweet nothings into its ear for the UE and says, hey, I'm really good, you should pick me or you should at least put me as a candidate for to, to camp on it. Um, and then your, your UE says, oh, okay, cool. You've passed my RRC checks. Now I'm going to, you know, uh, do the NAS attach procedure. And here's my MZ info. In a rogue base station, uh, it might have some, uh, you know, fake rogue MME to facilitate that request or to pretend like it's going to, uh, or it might not. Um, but uh, uh, let's see, moving on. Um, so this is what the high level architecture could look like for that. Um, it may or may not have a rogue MME, but either way, the rogue base station itself, the rogue cell, uh, pretending to be a cell tower with cells is going to, uh, attempt to facilitate that NAS attach procedure. Um, therefore divulging the MZ from your UE. And here is how, uh, that may, that may look, um, same, same thing as before, just showing in the bigger picture of everything. And um, an advanced, uh, an advanced setup may look like this. Uh, if there, if there is an ability to, uh, get into a legitimate, uh, you know, pre-existing core network, which, uh, from my take is incredibly difficult to do. Um, it would actually be, uh, easier to, it'd be more feasible to have your own emulation of the core network itself uh, that connects to either an existing PDN or its own PDN to facilitate its own connection. Um, evidence of this has yet to be seen in the wild, but based on the technology that I've discovered and the capabilities I've discovered, it's completely in the realm of possibility, super plausible, um, just haven't, uh, haven't seen it yet. Um, but I'm, what I'm saying is I'm not asserting it, but I'm unofficially positive that this is out there. Um, so what do they, let's see, uh, sorry, that, that was the last slide there. Uh, cell selection process in RRC. So th this is uh, what I've spent a lot of time uh, trying to figure out because a couple of years ago when I first started uh, uh, trying to ta tackle this topic, I was looking at it through a lens of privacy, personal privacy, because I, I didn't like the fact that, you know, this was something that can happen and we're all subject to it and we can't really do anything about it. Um, and then um, when I ended up uh, discovering the actual cyber physical, uh, you know, case for this uh, with, with physical real world, you know, 3D meat space implications, it, it spurred me to dig deeper. And that's where I found the radio resource control protocol, which handles um, mainly, mainly two things, uh, resource allocation, determining the resource blocks and elements in a UE um, that are to be allocated to process and communicate on a network. Um, and then uh, the cell selection, which should consist of two parts for it. Uh, cell selection consists of a process called cell selection and public land mobile network selection. A PLMN selection uh, is, excuse me, um, PLMN selection is essentially uh, matching your, like does the country code of this cell match what your MZ is able to, like what your phone is able to do based on your subscription. It's like, I'm in America, I got my service in America. Am I in America? Yes, I'm in America, okay, cool. Am I on the right network? Yes, okay, cool. Now I go into cell selection, which uh, that's where things kind of get uh, interesting. Uh, and here's, this is uh, this is from Cell Mapper. Uh, CellMapper.net, by the way, if you wanna look at this. CellMapper.com.net. Um, and uh, this is what the MCC is and the MNC. So 310 is uh, one of the few US uh, mobile country codes. And then the mobile network code 410, that is one of the few AT&T America uh, mobile network codes. So that's PLM and selection. This is cell selection. Uh, and cell selection um, is boiled down to one uh, core formula here, and that is uh, SRX and SQUAL are both over zero. And SRX, uh, SRX-LEV, that's the overall, uh, you know, 
power, the, the signal strength, if you will, right? Uh, it, it's it's given some core values from from the cell, and then that gets processed uh, by you know calculating uh, offsets of mins and maxes and whatnot of what that cell can do and what your UE can do, and that determines whether it's you know over zero. And then your quality is a similar scenario where uh, um, parameters that illustrate quality of the cell signal itself is given to the UE, and then your UE does its own you know, mini calculation inside the baseband processor for the RFC implementation to do that. And this formula here, so that cell, the cell selection of PLMN plus this calculation and this calculation have both, they've both been the uh, basically the exact same from 2G, 3G, 4G, and, and 5G. So you can look at the 3GPP documentation and you'll see the same exact formula. Some of the variables uh, may differ in name um, but it's the same, it is the same thing. And again, that, that's the RFC procedure that in this entire NAS attach procedure process uh, is what precedes uh, the NAS attach and PDN connectivity requests, uh, which subsequently your UE wants to divulge a subscriber identity to. So cell, cell tech and critical infrastructure, um, I, uh, I I just really looked at three areas for this. There, there's a lot, uh, but just to kind of, you know, build a picture of how ubiquitous this kind of technology is uh, in some day-to-day -day life and some upcoming systems, uh, I've got transportation manufacturing and power and going into transportation. Um, I did this, I'm just going to be showing some uh, graphics and talk a little bit about them. Uh, this is an ITS. Uh, this is an ITS pilot in Tampa, Florida, from the past couple of years. Uh, these are some, uh, you know, ITS uh, and some V2X vehicle to everything, uh, which I'm sure you all know. As I'm speaking at an automotive security conference, um, the vehicle to everything models, where you know connected vehicles can talk to various things, uh, people, infrastructure, network, uh, potentially other vehicles, depending on where on the DSRC versus CV2X, uh, you know, battle lines you fall on. <laughs> um, and this is uh, just a, a sample uh, of an RTU. This, this is from the um, uh, national, uh, national DOT uh, website here, but where they were talking about this pilot, but pretty much um, uh, uh, you have RTUs that are in the field that can connect over DRC uh, or sorry, DSRC uh, uh, dedicated um, uh, dedicated short range communications, which is like an offshoot of uh, I, uh, I, IEEE 802.11. I forgot the exact quote for it, but it's essentially an offshoot of Wi-Fi for vehicular communications and onboard equipment that also facilitate DSRC communications. And they have the same thing um, in in this next graphic. We'll see where in in this uh, uh, this is a diagram for that particular pilot that I just talked about in Tampa, Florida, where they had, um, they had added uh, the LTE cell network commun communications for the RSU, which is a roadside unit, which are things that are on the roadways to facilitate various functionality. Uh, and then here's just a, here's something that I, I had uh, had some hand in before. Uh, there was, you'll have uh, like freight optimization uh, systems that 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 uh, make traffic conditions for multimodal freight or in this case delivery truck to say, you know, hey, I'm coming close to the start or a certain area in this you know larger freight corridor. Um, I'm going to have a vehicular application inside of my vehicle, uh, which you know either can hit an RSU or hit a cell tower to send a signal, which ultimately gets routed to the TMC, which is the traffic management center, where they have the ATMS, which is the advanced traffic management system, which is like the dashboard of technology where you have all of your actual traffic traffic uh, system logic for that district. At, and it's basically like, hey, you're going to be taking this route, so we're going to make the traffic and try and make the traffic conditions as conducive as possible to that delivery of that freight. Um, and then we have CV2X, which I, I'm not going to get into uh, really, really, but just talking about it uh, in, in a very, very high level sense uh, where you've got different modes. Uh, so you have network assisted 
uh, CV2X, where basically you may come into an area where it's like, hey, you know, you can allocate these resources uh, because for 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 um, device to device communication, which is something that was brought out in an earlier vo uh, earlier vo uh, version of LTE, was in or initially for safety communication devices, but then you know it uh, it gets um, uh, kind of fit to the mobile connectivity use case uh, where you can have network assisted CV2X, you can have vehicle to vehicle CV2X, and that it's a whole can of worms. But that is stuff that's being tested. Uh, not sure how ubiquitous it is yet, but uh, here's just a high level graphic of, you know, um, how some of this all may work. Uh, I've got a, you know, traffic collision with uh, these three cars here. Uh, CCTV may see this, and RSU may pick it up based on signals from the on onboard equipment itself. It may tell an RSU or a vehicle directly to say, hey, this stuff is up ahead, be careful. And then cars that are outside of that range of that cell, you know, might be able to facilitate the, you know, like a, a daisy chain of device to device communication. Um, this is kind of like the, you know, like the the nice picture of it. Uh, it's not exactly this uh, concrete, but that's the idea. And I went a little bit too fast there. Uh, manufacturing, uh, manufacturing and, and plant floors have a, there's like a, a, a newer networking paradigm that's been making its, its way and becoming quite prevalent called the, um, uh, it's the, the connected plant floor where things, uh, certain processes are too disparate where it may or may not be feasible to actually route lines to and from different devices. So they might have uh, private RAM, uh, cellular connectivity between the different components have to talk to each other on whatever levels of the, you know, uh, from your management uh, and controls, your management systems all the way down to the level and control systems themselves, which facilitate the level zero physical processes. Uh, then you've also got uh, some power, which I just brought up uh, in power. Uh, I've done work in electro uh, electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Um, so, uh, you know, electric charging stations will have to phone home to various components and some of that's done on the wire, some of that's done wirelessly, depends on the vendor, depends on the manufacturer, depends on the use case. And uh, I brought up EV and power just because that's, that's something, you know, that's more automotive specific here. Um, but uh, connected vehicle cell attack vectors. Uh, before I start, just wanted to feed a, a couple stats out there because no presentation is complete without uh, a couple slides on stats, whether it be relevant or arbitrary. So uh, just a quick uh, a projected number of CVs operating in states from 2017 and 2030. By 2030, 100, estimated 146 million connected vehicles will be on U.S. roads. And then next, global IMSI catcher market forecast by 2030 is to be three, uh, 343.8 million. Um, Connect whatever dots you, you want to there. Uh, just wanted to bring it up. Um, so the, there are, are two main uh, there are two main things that I had uh, uh, thought of in this presentation for connected vehicle specific. Um, so there's you know software firmware over the air updates. Um, you know connected vehicles. Uh, uh, whether it be your, you know, various ECUs and need firmware updates, whether it be in vehicle containment sensors that need updates, um, anything you can think of. Um, cause I've looked at a, a, a few of the vehicular network, uh, automotive diagrams that are out there. Listeners may have seen a wider spread, which, which is totally cool. Um, those can be handled, uh, by the ECU itself. It could be facilitated, uh, facilitate their secure gateway. Uh, whether you're, you know, having to do those updates for uh, CAN bus network, automotive Ethernet, the other, you know, handful of uh, uh, vehicular networking protocols out there. Um, and some manufacturers can handle this process either through a Wi-Fi or through cell uh, or cell first and then, you know, uh, fail over to Wi-Fi or, or vice versa, depending on what the severity of that update is and what you've got to do. Uh, potential attacks. Uh, I'm going to talk about DNS poisoning and sinkhole. Uh, these are the two gaping ones that I've kind of uh, been able to surmise for this particular uh, surface here. And DNS poisoning, it's like, it's like, what is it? Why well, does it matter for connected vehicles? Well, if you have a, if you have a, um, in this scenario that you have an advanced rogue base station, which has a functioning 
you know, uh, uh, emulation of what a a radio access network, a RAN, and a core network is supposed to look like and supposed to do, and you you utilize the gap in the radio resource control protocol that I've illustrated before, um, why is your UE going to know the difference? Uh, it, it, it won't. Um, and we, we can get into like remote attestation and stuff like that later. But um, remote attestation and things like, you know, server verification updates, that's not going to work if you sinkhole it. Like if you're if you're starving communication, it, none of those processes are going to work. Um, so, and that's, uh, that's John, uh, so Mike was uh, just uh, just a quick uh, time check. We already three minutes over. Uh, OK, I, uh, OK, I'll wrap this up. So um, CV2X, which you talked about earlier, um, in CVs and RSUs, you have the same sinkhole attack, uh, just a little bit different, where in RSC, you're preventing the RSU from receiving information that CVs may need for safe travel. And then in CVs, you're starving, you know, these, the communication that you may need for a real-time uh, vehicle application of that. Then you may have malicious resource dissemination, which is if you do, in fact, have a, um, a advanced rug base station that you end up hitting, that's where you are being fed, uh, you know, malicious resource or, or false resources that don't really do anything for the CV2X network assisted um, functionality. And then on the RSU, it's similar, giving the RSU fake information to relay to receptive vehicles. Uh, potential mitigations, uh, I bring up VPNs. They're not a cure all, but it makes this really difficult, except if you have an insider information. Uh, you've got cell lock. Some manufacturers uh, of static applications have a capability to physically lock into a single cell tower. Amazing solution for stationary, not good for mobile application. Uh, algorithmic verification, uh, which is something that I had come up with, which uh, I will share after this presentation. Uh, summary and closing, uh, rogue base stations, moving functionality of the RAM, and some may do so for the core network also. Cell selection process in the RSC has a major gap that allows for RAN-based cellular connectivity subversion to occur. Uh, cell-enabled devices are present throughout various sectors of critical infrastructure. Many attack vectors covered and known of at this time. Um, there may be more. If, you, if any listeners have more, please let me know. I'm super open and receptive to uh, anything you, you have to say. Uh, so photo, soda, CV2X, and roadside equipment applications and potential mitigations uh, could be, you know, uh, vehicular VPN, uh, maybe, um, uh, maybe that's a long-term solution. Maybe not. Uh, cell lock mechanisms and algorithm verification in the baseband itself. Um, statements at this time. I don't know if any laboratories that are doing this particular specific research, uh, but if you don't, again, let me know. It helps helps me out. Uh, resources got SRS, RAN, Osmocom, BB. Uh, these are two open source um, uh, baseband and RAN uh, implementations. Uh, the DIY road base stations, MZ catchers. Um, uh, if there's a, a public place I could share these links, I will do so as soon as I get off this uh, presentation. Uh, CSO technical specification, which is a tech spec that I wrote on how to get around this, uh, which I can talk to more later. And contact info. If anyone wants to contact me at all, tell me, hey, this was good, this was bad, I have more info. What do you think on this? Um, hit me up on any of these platforms. All right, that is the end. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Mike. Uh, this was a great talk and uh, we already over time. So uh, for the audience, Mike will uh, be in the network networking lounge for stage two in case anyone has questions. Thanks a lot, Mike. And thanks uh, for the audience uh, to the audience. Yes. Yeah. Thank, thank everyone. Thank you.